starting it off with, go through the quiz. Grignard reagent, I gave you kind of a big clue up there on what our Grignard reagent looked like, which meant that our Grignard is supplying a carbon what? We're looking at a carbon nucleophile. Our Grignards typically react with, got a couple good answers you can run with on that one, electrophiles. It's kind of the boring answer. The other option would be, Mm, we could do carbocations. It's going to be hard to generate the carbocation at the same time. Isn't it just a partial so positive charge? We're looking at the partial positive charge coming from the oxygen that the carbon is attached to, right? Ish. From what functional group? Oh, carbonyl. Carbonyl, which could be a ketone, <coughs> aldehyde, formaldehyde. It could even be an ester, for that matter, which we'll also look at today. Okay. So we're trying to pick some carbon reagent, carbon nucleophile, and react with that carbon electrophile. So the idea is to come up with the structure. So if we look at our product, okay, we know one of our starting materials has that carbon or has that oxygen. Does that oxygen show up in our product? Yeah, it's that oxygen. How about our carbon? Does that show up in our product? Yeah, it's that carbon. So what's happening in the process of making this product? We're making a carbon-carbon bond between our nucleophile and our carbonyl carbon. Which of those carbon-carbon bonds is the bond made in this reaction? It's kind of a backhanded question. Could be this one. It could be this one, or it could be this one. There are three possible answers that you could have given for this. So what we'd be doing is breaking any one of those bonds to take us to a starting material. And in the process, work backwards to our negative carbon nucleophile and our partially positive carbonyl. Okay? So let's take a look at our orange product. If we break that bond, where would those electrons go? To our carbon attached to the oxygen or the carbon not attached to the oxygen. Why? Okay, so if we take the electrons and put them there, when we separate this, what do we end up with? A negative carbon. What happens to our other carbon out on the other side? It would be positively charged. Does this match the pattern that we just showed with our possible starting material? No. Where do the electrons actually go? We're looking at the orange electrons. If we take them towards the oxygen, let's show that option. So you're saying we're going to make that pi bond, right? To make that pi bond, how many electrons would be around that oxygen? Too many, which means we'd have to break a bond. What bond do we break? We could break the hydrogen bond. It's a good option. So where do the electrons in that bond go? They'd have to go to the hydrogen, which means we have hydride. Is that particularly stable? No. no. That is a horrible option. Okay, so you guys are all focusing on trying to make the carbonyl. But the Grignard reagent centered around what? A negative carbon. Is that negative carbon attached to the carbonyl carbon? No, it's the separate reagent. Where should the electrons in that bond go? The other direction to make our nucleophilic carbon. So if we go through and now show those electrons shift back to this carbon, what's our result? Our carbon now has what charge? negative on that carbon. I know we got two different carbons floating around here. That makes it confusing. How about this carbon? What charge does it become? It would be positively charged. Could I stabilize that positive charge somehow? We could say the negative of our nucleophile, but let's dance away from that nucleophile. Is there another negative somewhere? The oxygen lone pairs could do what? They could create a bond. 
But then oxygen has too many bonds, and it wants to get its electrons back because it would pick up a positive. Where can it get those electrons? From the hydrogen, kicking off hydrogen at what charge? Is that a reasonable thing to kick off? All right, seeing the backwards thought? All right, what else would I have to fix on this structure to actually have my correct answer? Okay, I accept that answer, the lone pair on the oxygen, yeah. What else? Okay, so we can add the magnesium bromide. Where would that go? To the negative. Put on our magnesium and our bromine. What else do we need? So what we're saying is we mix those two reagents and we get that final product, right? Water. Okay, we could follow it up with water. There's our H plus. There's our step two. I'd argue there's another really big issue. What's that really big issue? Where's the rest of our carbon structure? Okay, so we would have. Uh, where are we? So that's. One carbon followed by two, three, and we would have one carbon followed by our second carbon. Now we've got our product, right? As a check, we should go through and count all our carbons. How many carbons did we start with on our product? Not that I don't trust you, I just had to count two. We got 11. Take a look at our guess for our product or our starting material. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11. Hey, look at that. Our carbons can't match up. We've got our H plus that naturally actually just fell right off of the structure thinking in reverse. We've got our carbonyl and we have our Grignard reagent. How many people provided that answer? Oh well, not a big deal. I know at least two of you provided that answer because I just looked at them. Hi. So we've got a couple people that saw that one. Was there another bond we could have chosen to break? Yeah, we could have gone with say that blue bond. Where would the electrons have gone in that case? We'll go up to the carbon to generate. Our nucleophilic carbon with our negative charge. The rest of our structure. Okay, we've got our carbonyl carbon with our OH on it. Uh, Sorry, yeah, I missed that carbon. I keep doing it. We'll just cram it in there. We've got that structure, right? And then we have one, two, three. The last three carbons. What charge would our center carbon be in that case? If we just broke that bond, that would be positive. How can we stabilize that positive? Same way we did before and return it to the carbonyl. There's step one. We mix those two reagents, followed by step two, H3O plus, to put the hydrogen back on our carbonyl oxygen to give us that alcohol. You guys see it? Yes? So, sorry, what was that? Why did you choose that one? Because it has the smallest carbon. It's a good choice. <laughs> What you might expect on the ACS test would be which of the following procedures works to generate this product. They provide all three, followed by your fourth answer of all of the above. Okay. So someone real quickly going through looks at the first answer and says, yes, that is absolutely the correct answer. That is perfectly valid, and bubbles in A and moves on. Whoops. Look at all of your answer choices. Okay. Last one. Take a look at that purple bond. What happens? Where are those electrons in that purple bond going to spend most of their time if we're going to go backwards? Back to the left. We generate our negatively charged species again, which we can temporarily stabilize with our Grignard, being our magnesium bromide. What happens with the rest of our structure? What charge would our center oxygen be? That guy in there. Center carbon, oxygen or carbon? Carbon, sorry. Center carbon. carbon. You're right. Positive. It'd be positive. So what do we need to do? Stabilize it by forming our carbonyl. 
We'd react our Grignard with the carbonyl followed by step two of H3O+. plus. Water is a possibility. We do see that with the lithium aluminum hydride. Um, typically when it's the Grignard, we'll write H3O+, plus, or even just H+. Plus. Okay. Kind of makes sense? Would you necessarily react it with lithium aluminum hydride to get the hydride? Uh, are we using a hydride at all in this case? No. So the, the issue that, the, why I brought up the lithium aluminum hydride is what he suggested was why not just add water, okay? And in the lithium aluminum hydride reaction, we can add water to protonate everything, okay? We don't add water in the lithium aluminum hydride situation because that species acts as a wicked strong base, generating a bunch of what gas? Hydrogen gas, which is highly flammable, we want to minimize that reaction, do that as slowly as possible to control the hydrogen evolution as opposed to getting a giant big ball of hydrogen gas coming out of the top of our reaction and potentially catching fire. It's kind of problematic. So here we aren't concerned about hydrogen gas formation, so we can throw in a stronger acid to go ahead and protonate and get us to our final stage. Hi. Okay. Yes. So it's not officially a T-butyl. It's five carbons out there, not four. So yeah, it's more like a, a, a T-pentyl-ish. Um, and yeah, we can run into a steric issue, but remember our Grignard is super, super reactive. So if we were told to rank which of these, yes. If we're told just to provide which of these is going to get us a product, all three are working. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Why would we want the smaller one to be negative, to be our nucleophile? What do nucleophiles need to do? They attack. They attack what? Electrophiles. Electrophiles. Good option. What atom is our electrophile typically? Um, carbon. carbon. Where are the carbons found? Mm, okay. What's the opposite of it acting as a nucleophile? It would act as a, okay, that was, <laughs> with, still within the class of negatively charged species, it's going to act as a base. Bases react with hydrogen. hydrogen. Where's hydrogen found? On the outside of, the surf, of our structure. Where are the carbons found? On the inside of our structure. So if we want a nucleophile, okay, the nucleophile needs to get into the inside of the structure. So sterically, it should be as small as possible so it can make it to the inside. Because if it's really big, it can't make it in to react with our positive carbons, and instead it reacts with the positive hydrogens, and we get an acid-base reaction, not the nucleophile electrophile. Okay? Make sense? Is there well, another that's question? Kind of what I was thinking is this, and when you look at what your, your ketone Mm -hmm. looks like in, in the main structure, the way that it's drawn here, you know, you, you've got that rotation of the, the alcohol formula yeah. on, the, on the bottom side, but I think that's because as that nucleophile comes in, you know, you have made it a flip or whatever, but it's because those sigma bonds can rotate, but it wouldn't normally be in that position. Your ketone is not going to be in that position. Your ketone is freely moving at all random right. time. So we can't really say at this position it's only going to be there. This group can freely rotate back up to right. the side or the other direction. Okay, so we got free motion everywhere. Okay, and where I think you guys are visualizing this too is a backside attack. Mm -hmm. When do we see backside attacks? On sp3 atoms when we're doing substitution. Is this really a substitution? we look at the net result, what happened when we look at our reaction? Not a reduction, well, yes-ish. Technically. Technically, it does fall under that, okay? Well, look further. We got the five major types of reactions. What are those five major types? Addition, Addition substitution, Addition. elimination, Addition. radical, and acids and bases. What did we do in this case? Addition. We did an addition. Okay. In the addition reaction, do we worry about backside attack? No, no because backside attack is for substitution. Okay. Why do we not worry about it as a backside attack? What's reacting in the case of the addition reaction? 
the pi bonds, which are located above and below the reaction. There's no backside attack because we aren't attacking the backside of the bond. We're actually attacking directly the bond itself. Okay. So we get a slightly different dynamic with that. Okay. Another fun question we could throw in it. Does our product have a chiral center? Yes. Yes. Do we expect optical activity for this product? Why no? Because our nucleophile can attack where? From the top end of our p orbitals or the bottom, the bottom end, which means we get zero optical activity because we get a racemic mixture. Okay? So we get the same complications as we got with our standard addition reactions. Our addition reactions give you that same problem, right? Because we have the top and the bottom lobe. Okay? Um, questions? If you don't see the chirality, this is one that you don't have to stress too much on. Why? You get a mixture. You get them both. So don't stress. Both show up. OK. Yeah, that's what I was afraid was going to happen. I want to throw in a new question here along the Grignards, and I didn't get time to actually make this a nice slide. When we talked about our Grignards, what functional group did we start with? Okay, carbonyl in general is what we started with, but what functional groups did I actually talk about both Monday and what we just started with? We looked at two primary functional groups. Ketones, aldehydes. What functional group do we have? Ester. Does the ester going to change the dynamics of the reaction? Yes and no. It depends how we're going to answer that question, probably. Would we expect the carbonyl to react with the Grignard? Yes. 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 Okay, so what will happen? The Grignard attacks the carbonyl, breaks open that oxygen bond, and we generate what structure? Oh, shouldn't have worked out. with our Grignard reagent down below, right? What happens now? So now we could move on to step two and say step two, we add the H3O plus to it. Have we seen this structure before, before we even bring in the H3O plus? And of course, since I'm asking that question. Yes. Yes. Good answer. When did we see it before? What was LAH? Aluminum. Lithium aluminum hydride. What happened when we reacted an ester with lithium aluminum hydride? It reacted twice. Why does it react twice? It all centered on this structure, which we will be talking about after our exam. What's the issue with this structure? I know I gave you a name. You probably don't remember it. That's OK. We're looking at an acetal. Close enough to it. Right? That's what I called it, at least. What's the issue with acetals? They are unstable. And what will end up happening is that the acetal will decompose. The electrons come back down because the oxygen is saying, I'm sp3 hybridized. I can't deal with this many oxygens. So it pulls the electrons back down from the oxygen. But now what happens? Too many bonds. So we have to kick something out. What do we kick out? The other oxygen. The result is I get what for my product? Try very, very carefully with this. Oh, never mind. You were right about the ketone. I didn't look at it right. It's a ketone and then that methoxide ion. What's the issue with the ketone? It reacts with Grignard reagents. So now let's take a step further back. Which would I expect to react preferentially with the Grignard reagent, the ketone or the ester? Preferentially? Preferentially. 
So now we start with two esters and two Grignard reagents. After one reaction cycle, we're now down to one ester, one Grignard, and one ketone. What does the Grignard react with? Ketone. The ketone. Why? The ester still has a double bond to an oxygen. It's easier to pull off, because there's like a bunch of oxygens pulling each other. Mm, there's our answer, so kind of a cross between you guys. In the ester, what happens? There's resonance, which does what to the carbonyl carbon? It stabilizes. stabilizes it. It becomes less positive, which then means it's less likely to react. The Grignard now given the choice, the less positive or the most positive, what does it react with? most positive, okay. it reacts with the ketone, the end result is we get, well, second to end result, our O negative with a second CH3 attached. All right, we still have that O minus floating around just for balancing sake. All right. Now we evaluate that carbon again. Right? It's got carbons attached to it. It shares electrons equally with those. Nothing to really overstress that carbon. Take it a step further. If we tried to say that carbon said, I want electrons back and try to take them from the oxygen, what happens? There's nothing for it to kick out. So what happens? We stall our reaction at this point. Our reaction cannot continue any further until we add in our step two, the H3O+. Plus, which then takes us to our final answer, CH3, okay. Depending on the question asked, you may be required to specify both. Sapling has been having a habit of having you specify both species. Most typically, which product would we look at, A or B? typically focus on A. Okay. In our cases, we t well, actually, I was going to say, because we're looking at forming alcohols, but we formed an alcohol in both cases. Okay. So we tend to look for our larger organic structure is what we're focusing on. Okay. Can you go back to the original one? So, uh, with... Mm, Let's hold that thought for just a second because I don't have any space to draw the theme aluminum hydride up here. Let's make sure everybody's happy with the Grignard reacting all the way through. Yes. How do you form B? Where did B come from? What happened here? We kicked out a leaving group of? O minus. That O minus doesn't disappear, right? It's still here. Then we add H3O plus. What happens? You still have H2O. Uh, yeah. The H plus will protonate both this negative oxygen and this negative oxygen. So we get our primary alcohols, our functional group, and then our secondary. I wrote it out as OCH3 here as opposed to the O line, which brings up another point. What is that atom right there at the end of that point? C That's a carbon with only one bond, which means? three implied hydrogens. So I wrote it out as the formula here as opposed to the straight line. Okay, which brings up another issue. When we look at our reactions, you'll notice that I almost always give you structures. Okay, why do I give you structures as opposed to, say, formulas? So we can see how these things react. When you look at an exam, okay, no one's trying to explain to you the answer in the exam. So what do they end up giving you in the exam? They give you the formulas. So realize you need to be able to convert back and forth between formula and structure. Right? And I haven't done the greatest job yet on trying to force you to do that. So with the synthesis questions, I think I'm going to start bringing in more formulas and force you to look at the formulas in each of those cases as opposed to the structures. Right? I agree, I don't like it, but that's the way it's tested because we use typewriters. When we use typewriters, we've got to put it in a straight line. It's too easy or too difficult to draw weird three-dimensional structures. Okay? Simone, I think you got another question. That was my question. About where the OCH3 came from? Okay, everybody clear with what's up here? Okay, now let's go back to Janine's question with the LAH. 
I'm going to do some subtle changes to this. If you're going to try and draw everything again, you're probably going to hate me. I apologize, because I'm just going to selectively erase. We've got lithium, our positive, and our aluminum hydride. What did the aluminum hydride supply? Which was H minus. What's the nucleophile in lithium aluminum hydride? H minus is our nucleophile. What was our nucleophile in the Grignard reaction? The carbon. Okay, a CH3. So wherever we had our carbon, let's replace it with hydrogen. hydrogen. So in our very first step, what do we have? We have, again, that weird acetal. What does the acetal do? Crunches back down, kicks out the leaving group, and we end up with our product where our CH3 is now hydrogen, and we now have an aldehyde. Between the aldehyde and the ester, what does our hydride nucleophile react with preferentially? The aldehyde. the aldehyde. So it reacts a second time. Now what happens? We end up with this structure again. The negative charge tries to come back down, but there's nothing to kick out. So our reaction stalls until we add, officially with the lithium aluminum hydride, we added not H3O plus, but H2O. our H2O. Why? Well, we talked about that. We're trying to limit the explosive gases coming off the top of our reaction. It's usually a good idea to minimize those. We have high, so careful. We have hydride. What are we supplying in step two? Just hydrogen. Hydrogen ion, H plus, not hydride. Two different things. And then the result, when we get to our final answer, is where we had our carbons, we put on our hydrogens. And we end up with what kind of alcohol? A primary alcohol. So our esters, in the presence of lithium aluminum hydride, go all the way down to primary alcohols. And depending on our structure, that O negative leaving group, our ox oxyanion that was kicked out, we may decide to care about. Okay, so if you think back to that quiz that we had, why did we care about that alcohol being formed? I know, that quiz was a while ago. Nope. It was a cyclic structure. That O negative was part of the structure, so we have to include it. Okay? That's what made that question even trickier, because we were looking at an intramolecular uh, reaction in a ring opening. That ring opening, now we have to include that alcohol because it's part of our parent structure. Okay, so depending on what you're starting with, you may decide at different cases what happens with those pieces. Okay, does that solve your question about the lithium aluminum hydride? Okay. So now what we've got are the summary slides. This one I didn't really change. I did simplify it a little bit up at the top, which is nice because you can't read it right now on this PowerPoint um, or on our projectors. So we're looking at the synthesis of alcohols from alkyl halides or alkenes. The top one is our alkyl halides. All right, so when we're looking at our alkyl halides with our Rx, there's two mechanisms that we can run under, SN1 or SN2. How do we decide which mechanism we're actually running under? We can look at the strength of the nucleophile. So in this case, I said SN1, we're using water as our nucleophile, whereas in SN2, we're using OH minus, because OH minus is a strong nucleophile. What else could we look for? Let's say we're told to figure out what reagent to use. What nucleophile should we add? Right now we can't guess at it. We'd have to look for something else. What else would we look for in a substitution reaction to help us decide which mechanism? We could look at the substrate. Under an SN1 reaction, what substrate do we want? a more substituted halide, which is our tertiary halides. If it was primary, what does that mean? It's got to go SN2, which means the nucleophile we select must be strong. Okay, so it's trying to piece together each of those individual sections. Yes, we are asking you to process stuff that you learned last semester. I know, it's a challenge, but that's what organic chemistry does. In fact, I would make the argument that this entire slide is from first semester. All right, and the next part of it is we can go through and do synthesis of alcohols from our alkenes. 
Okay. To do the alkenes, what type of reaction are we going to be using? We're starting with a double bond, and we end with, in all those cases, alkane slash alcohols. We're doing an addition reaction. So with our alkyl halides, we're doing substitution. With our alkene starting material, material we're doing additions. Okay. The uh, epoxide is tagged on there as well. I want to talk about that because there were some, was some confusion with that. Um, and that is my fault. I always tell you epoxide is MCPBA because that's most typically what you see it as. I did forget that there's another common way that you will see that. MCPBA is an example. I drew up this structure. Right? This goes back to that structure versus formula argument. Okay? If the ACS exam is saying, yeah, let's give them the structure, sure, you'll see this and you can go, oh, this acts just like MCPBA because I saw that. More than likely, they typed it, which means they're going to give you the formula. R-C-O-3-H. One and the same. Really, are you just, honestly, aren't you just looking for this, the, yeah, the three carbons and then the hydrogen? The three the oxygens. oxygens. Yeah. Hey, I do it too. We're looking for those three oxygens. Yep, and if you see three oxygens next to each other, that should be a really big tip-off that you're looking at and it, uh, doing a peroxy acid, you're forming an epoxide. So three oxygens is huge, epoxide. Okay? Just for the sake of argument, because I've noticed a lot of people make this mistake too, what if you're given this formula? Can you guys read that? Okay, so CO2H. What is that? It's the carboxylic acid. Also written as COOH. Both of those are a carboxylic acid. We're not bonding the oxygen to the oxygen in these cases. Okay? So those are your reagents for synthesizing alcohols from your alkyl halides and from your alkenes. I think that covers them all. Uh, I didn't talk about a few of them because you probably actually won't see them this semester. They showed up on the first, our first semester's exams. So that's the osmium tetroxide and the permanganate. I doubt you'll see those this semester. I'm certainly not going to ask, ask for them on this next exam. Um, and I'd be surprised if they show up on the, on the final. Okay, those two, yeah. The others are definitely all fair game. Another way we can synthesize alcohol is from carbonyls. In the carbonyls, we talked about two different types of reactions, or not, sorry, two, one reaction, the addition reactions for our carbonyls, okay, but we use two different nucleophiles. In that upper case, we're using sodium borohydride or lithium aluminum hydride. And in those cases, what was our nucleophile? Our nucleophile was H minus. Right. What I tried to do was give you a generic overall arching structure so that you now know when you react a carbonyl with lithium bor or sodium borohydride you can potentially end up with a primary alcohol, a secondary alcohol, or no reaction, depending on what the R group is. All right, does everybody see that, or should I walk through and explain that notation? I want to make sure everybody understands what my abbreviations are. <sighs> OX is a good question. Uh, I ran out of variables. Okay, if I put in another R, then I, I, we already say R, and I'm getting a cyclic definition. R equals OR, but R equals OR, right? Okay, so that doesn't work. If I did a capital X, capital X typically means halogens, and I'm not trying to say it's a halogen. That can be anything, hydrogen or uh, carbon. Okay, those are our two common places. Well, I guess I could have done carbon slap, or comma hydrogen. When we move to lithium aluminum hydride, we get the exact same chemistries for our aldehydes and ketones, except what happens when we go through and have 
RR oxygen. Okay. It reacts a second time. You notice I forgot to put on the X. That X can be anything again. It can be nothing. It can be a hydrogen. It can be a carbon. Okay. If it's nothing, what functional group is that? Uh, that's a bad question. We haven't talked about it yet. Let's do it anyway. So if it's nothing, what's necessarily implied on that oxygen? There's no hydrogens or carbons, which means you've got to satisfy its octet, which means it's negatively charged. The name of that species is, yeah, you got it. Uh, what was that? Car carboxylate. Okay. We will talk about that name at the end. If you've been looking at MCAT or PCAT stuff or that, and stat is the other one, right? Um, they'll talk about carboxylates. Okay, so that's what they're referring to is the negatively charged uh, carboxylic acid. Not oxygen, a negatively charged carboxylic acid. acid. Okay. Okay. If it's a negatively charged oxygen on its own, we just call that an oxyanion. Right. Okay. Here it's a carboxylate because it's part of what was a carboxylic acid. Okay. Yes? Did it? Okay, so this comes from understanding what I've got drawn up here. This is why I asked. Okay, what she's asking is why did sodium borohydride react in this case? Did it react in this case? No. Okay. The R equals OX. What we're saying is that what we started with was this structure. What did we end with? The exact same thing. There was no reaction. Okay. So I asked. Thank you for asking that because a couple people have been like, oh, okay. Sodium borohydride isn't reactive enough to react with those. Okay. Remember, as soon as we put on that oxygen, we now get resonance stabilization of that carbonyl carbon. That neutralizes its reactivity. Sodium borohydride isn't reactive enough to react with that carbon. So there's always a threshold of when it stops reacting. For the sodium borohydride, it can't react if that R group is anything other than hydrogen or carbon. It only reacts with the aldehyde, aldehyde or ketone. ketone. Uh, it's limited to that. Yep. Whereas our lithium aluminum hydride does it all. All the way through. And then the with the metal, right. then so, good point. When we say reacts all the way through for the lithium aluminum hydride, it's reacting all the way through for carbonyls, right. not, not alkenes, yeah. not pi bonds in general, but carbonyls. Okay, at least at this point. Okay, more questions on that top one. Bottom right, what's happening in the bottom right? Type of reactions happening in the bottom right? We're looking at the Grignard reaction. You'll notice in this summary, I didn't show anything about, I think I spelled that right, uh, the formation of the Grignard, because you're not officially responsible for that. We show, I showed you that so you could see it, because I think it's neat and interesting. You can do whatever you want with that part of that talk on Monday. All right, so our Grignard here, we're starting with our Grignard reagent. That R can be any carbon structure. It can be sp2, it can be sp3, it can be sp, okay? Any carbon structure, okay? I don't really think that was maybe emphasized enough, though. But sure. I don't okay. know, I'm sure you said it, but it was, uh, I think we kind of... I showed it as, I showed at the, pretty much the two possibilities. Yeah. The benzene structure, so an sp2 carbon, and then sp3 we saw with the CH3s. So it's there, I just didn't explicitly state it. So that can be any carbon structure. Would we do it with an sp carbon? It's possible, but why would we do it? What were you suggesting? 
not quite. So we draw it up. Here's our SP carbon. Would I ever expect to put that into a Grignard formation? No. Why not? No, there's a hydrogen. Okay. We can do an acid base reaction much more easily than doing the Grignard reaction. Okay. So why bother to go through and set up the alkyl halide to get our Grignard when we could just use our SP carbon, uh, remove the hydrogen, and have it act as a nucleophile already? Okay. So there's no reason to do an SP carbon uh, with a Grignard reagent. Theoretically, possible, just why bother? Okay. Yes? How can, it, how can that happen, the first one, when R is called two hydrogen? So what's happening in this first case? Okay. This was the very first mechanism we actually showed. If those R groups are two hydrogens, how reactive is our carbonyl carbon? Very reactive. The hydrogens can't stabilize that positive, so that carbon becomes very, very reactive. The Grignard comes in and attacks, and there's, we're running into R group issues. That's why I colored them. Our Grignard R group comes in and attacks, okay? and we end up with our oxide or our oxyanion. If our red R groups are hydrogens, all we did was put our R group on, and we got our alcohol. What type of alcohol would we have in this case? A primary alcohol. What if those red R groups were a carbon and a hydrogen? Now we get a secondary alcohol. What if those R groups were, what's the next one? Two carbons. You get a tertiary alcohol. And I left one of them off. Okay, what if we were looking at one of those R groups being an oxygen? Okay, but that oxygen I'm being very, very particular on. Okay, so we're looking at this particular instance right here. Yes. O, oh, and then another R out there. So something out there. Okay, let's just make it a CH3 just for the sake of it. We're looking at the ester functional group. What happens when we act the Grignard with the ester? It kicks it out, and we get our R group adding twice. And that's what we're showing in that case. Okay, everybody see that? What happens in the very last case? What's the functional group? Carboxylic acid. What's the result of a carboxylic acid reaction? Nothing. Nothing. Okay. Because the carboxylic acid is acidic, the Grignard pulls off the hydrogen. We end up right back where we started, our carboxylic acid, and our protonated Grignard reagent, the HR. Unfortunately, that 3 jumped in there. That 3 is not supposed to be there. That's the slide number. Okay. Everybody see that? HR is down in the very, very lower right-hand corner. Right, where's that? Okay, that HR, our R is from our Grignard. Mm -hmm. It pulls the hydrogen off of our carboxylic acid to form our HR. Oh, no. We follow it up with step two, H3O+, plus, put the hydrogen right back on our carboxylic acid, and we're right there. Okay. So in, this, in that case, the, the carbon from the Grignard doesn't attach to the it does not attach to the carbonyl. Okay. So we would call this a no reaction as a possibility. This is the one that we talked about and said that could be tricky on the ACS exam. What they could end up giving you as the answer is your carboxylic acid to start with, or they could also give you the HR as a possible product, as a product. Because it is a reaction. A reaction did occur. It's an acid-base reaction. It's just not the addition reaction that we wanted to occur or that we might have predicted to occur. So that's what I said. It depends on how the question is phrased and what they're actually fishing for. Now, on a multiple choice exam, there's two answers. Or we come up with three correct answers. The carboxylic acid starting material, the Grignard with the hydrogen attached to it, or no reaction. All three of those are possible correct answers. Okay? At no point would you say no reaction and provide the carboxylic acid and the Grignard with the, our hydrogen attached. Because both of those answers imply that a reaction occurred. Okay, so no reaction is actually a really bad answer choice because a reaction did happen. It just wasn't the standard Grignard addition reaction that we would want. Okay. Yes. Okay. Last one that didn't actually make it up onto the slide, so we'll 
clear everything, or actually there are questions on what's up there. Okay, clear everything away. Last one with our Grignards, what happens? Take our CH3 MGBR, and I react it with CO2. It's the product. Uh, followed by a step two of H3O plus. You want a hint yet? You want a hint yet? Let's take it as a hint. Here's a hint. CO2 structure is this. What happens? CH3 MGBR, our green reagent, really acts as CH3 minus, right? That minus needs to find a positive. Where's that positive? Our carbonyl carbon. The result. Here before, remember when we reached this stage before, we tried to push the electrons down? Sure, we can push those electrons down. What happens? We kick it out there. We end up with the exact same structure. Okay. So in this case, we do have a way to kind of account for those two oxygens being present. Our carbon is sp2 hybridized, which is also fixing that issue. Okay. So we don't have anything to really kick out as a leaving group. We then follow this up with the H3O+, and we end up with carboxylic acid, also known as acetic acid, vinegar, <laughs> drawn upside down. Okay, so CO2 can react like an electrophile. Okay. Any carbonyl should be evaluated as a potential site for a reaction with a Grignard reagent. Okay. Before you actually push it, you just have to decide, is there some positive hydrogen getting in the way? Okay. Yes? Do we make vinegar this way? Use the cap on that? We could make vinegar this way if we wanted to. There's a lot cheaper way to make vinegar. But it won't react again in this case? Uh, what do you mean react again? When's the H3O plus added? After the Grignard reagent has reacted. Theoretically, there's no Grignard reagent left when you add the H3O plus. It's not true, but theoretically. Okay. And then, oh, I think I see what you're, what you're talking about, maybe. Why does the Grignard reagent not react to that second carbonyl? Okay. Then we'd end up with, um, if that happened... Really, we'd end up with that. Remember in the previous case, we had two oxygens attached to our carbon, and it didn't like that? Yeah. What happens in this case? If we got three oxygens, really, really doesn't like that. Okay. The other way we could address it is, is that carbonyl active to begin with? Okay. Our carboxylate, our first structure. We have resonance stabilization to stabilize that positive, and it is much stronger uh, resonance stabilization than that for an ester because that oxygen has no other bond to share its electrons with. It can really only share them with the carbon. So we completely neutralize uh, the electrophilic character of that carbon. Does that make sense? Do you see it? Can you run a Grignard reaction in water? No. So don't give me if we don't have water. You don't have water, period. <laughs> if water is present, you do not do your Grignard addition. You do the acid-base reaction. Okay. So that's where you have to be careful because they will throw curveballs like that. Say, okay, this reaction was done in the presence of water as the solvent. What's your product? And one of your products will be what you would expect for a Grignard reaction. One of them will be if it was the acid-base reaction. Okay. So if there is any acidic hydrogen, the Grignard reaction fails as we would hope it to do doing that uh, electrophilic carbonyl addition. What we end up seeing instead is the acid-base reaction. But 
base reaction. There's a reaction. It's the acid-base reaction. So you have to focus on your Grignards. Do two chemistries, acid-base and your additions. If there's an acidic hydrogen anywhere, acid-base. Yes? Okay. And you add the acetylide to something, then you can't use water to quench it, right? Because if you use water to quench what you created, or to take off the hydrogen on the end of the acetylide? Um, so it sounds to me like you're asking two qu a different question. Because the acetylide we won't use for vineyards. We won't use it. Because why go through the process of making a vineyard, a carbon nucleophile with an acetylide, through the vineyard mechanism when all you had to do was remove the hydrogen to begin with? And it's already a, a nucleophile. We wouldn't use it in addition. We wouldn't use it. We can use it in an addition. We just don't use it in a Grignard addition. The Grignard is making a carbon nucleophile specifically from the magnesium. That's your Grignard. Okay, so there's way too many questions on this slide, so we're going to go through it really, really slow. CH3, MgBr equals, see, I'm going to put the hydrogens on the other side, negatively charged, plus our CO2, which takes us to this structure, our attack. Because there's no acidic hydrogens, that's all that can happen. We end up with our CH3 attached to our carbon. There's our oxygen with a negative charge. Carbon here. We have the carbonyl. Can the Grignard attack? If it goes through and attacks a second time, all right, to do this, all right, we end up with an sp3 carbon structure. Oh, and actually, it gets really messy. This structure, which is our acetal, the acetal is unstable. It freaks out and says, heck no, this is bad, I need to go backwards. So we push the pi electrons down. The result is, what do we kick out? Oxygen. As what? If we kick out the oxygen, what do we have? O minus 2. Was O minus a stable leaving group? No. No, and it depended on what environment it went into that we could make it reasonable. If O minus was bad, what is O minus 2? Stupidly, ridiculously bad. That is an awful, 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 awful choice. So the O minus cannot be kicked out, or our O minus 2 can't be kicked out, which means what gets kicked out instead? Our CH3, which is also an awful leaving group, but what is it leaving into? That exact same solution. Okay, it's a bad leaving group, but it's not worse than where it started. So it gets kicked back out, and we end up with right back where we started. Now that we're stuck at this position, what happens? Well, nothing happens. Okay? And that goes all the way back. So that doesn't happen. And then we follow it up with step two with our H3O+, and that puts us at our final product. Does that make more sense now? Everybody got that? And that should better answer your question that you had a little bit. And that should answer your question as well, please. Okay. Bottom line, CO2 with Grignard reagents gives you carboxylic acids. Keep it at that. Okay. I had expected to finish a lot earlier, but oh well. We also have our summary of our substitution eliminations, and I'm pretty sure that's my summary. <laughs> Sorry, that's all I had. Last thing, this is really quick. I doubt you'll see it on the ACS test. I don't think I'll even write it into your uh, exam, but there are two questions on sapling that talk about this. It's called protecting groups. Uh, if we wanted to do a Grignard reaction, let's take a look at our starting material in this case, this BR with the alcohol in it. We have an alkyl halide. What can we do with alkyl halides? We can convert them into Grignards. Fantastic. Except, if we convert it into a Grignard, what's at the other end of the alkyl halide?
and acidic hydrogen, which means what happens? We immediately form and quench the Grignard all in one dramatic step. That was pretty useless. We actually took ourselves backwards in chemistry. And in this case, not only took ourselves backwards in chemistry, but took us so far backwards, it's going to be really hard to get back forwards, okay, to get back to where we started. So what we want to do is put something on in the structure that prevents the alcohol from acting as an acid, which means get rid of the hydrogen. But if we get rid of the hydrogen, then we have this negative oxygen, and that can do chemistry as well. So we want to get rid of all kind of functionality at that position. The reagent that we can go through and do is put in this uh, what was it TMSCl, okay, trimethyl silyl chloride. Okay, if you remember in lab TLC, what does TLC use? Thin layer, right? What's the thin layer? Silica, which was SiO. We've got a relatively strong bond between the oxygen and the silicon. Okay. That bond is actually so strong that we can do pretty much any chemistry we want now, and that oxygen will not react. Okay. We've completely neutralized the reactivity there. And it's also not a very good leaving group. So what ends up happening? Now I can do whatever I want on the bromide side because my alcohol is protected. It's effectively an alkane. Okay. So if you run into this situation where you have two reactive positions and you don't want the alcohol to react, you can put on a protecting group. The protecting group we're looking at is TMSCl. Okay, so it goes on and it stops the reactivity of the alcohol. But what if you want the alcohol reactivity back? We've got to get rid of that group that we just said was impossible to remove. Okay? That's a bit problematic. It turns out it's not completely impossible to remove. Oh, shoot. I thought there was a little bit more down there. Um, what we can end up doing is adding a second reagent, okay, TBAF, which is tetrabutyl ammonium fluoride. Okay. In that environment, the fluoride now acts as a pretty good nucleophile. Such a good nucleophile that it comes in, backside attacks the silicon, kicking out the oxygen. Now we've got our alcohol back. And the hydrogen can be supplied by what's the last reagent that you would add? H3O plus. Okay. So we can get our H3O plus added in there as well. So those are, it's a possible thing to show up within sapling. Two questions center on it at the very end of, I think it's the Grignard homework. Okay, it's the last two questions. They're synthesis questions, but those two questions are, are looking at the TMSCL and the tea bath. Okay. So all it is is a protecting group of alcohols. That's it. Okay. Simone, was that a question? Yeah, if backside attacks the oxygen. The silicon. Okay. To kick out the oxygen so we get our alcohol back. Yeah, if it attacked the oxygen, we'd have a problem. Okay. okay. That is officially the last slide. Wow, I talk way too long. How confident are you guys? Should we keep going over review stuff or go into the sapling homework? And officially we have the room till three, so we got a lot of time. We've only got five minutes left in class though. Okay, well I'm just gonna